A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 152nd episode of Together for Education webinars brought to you by Notebook. Over 20 months ago in April 2020, when the pandemic had just set in and schools had closed down, we at Notebook felt it was our duty to set up a platform for educators to connect meaningfully on, discussing problems they were facing with the rising need of digital education and arrive at common solutions. Today, 152 episodes later, this platform has grown much bigger than we could have anticipated, all thanks to your love and support. We've discussed extremely curricular topics here, topics like digital learning and NEP and assessments, extracurricular topics like sports and theater, the topics like school finance, or even evolved topics like mental health. Most countries see school education as a national subject, and every country has one or more boards or governing bodies in school education. Based on the prevailing socioeconomic conditions, these bodies decide on the direction they want to give their school education system. In our country itself, we have moved from Gurukuls to the Macaulay system aimed at supplying resources for the East India Company's growth in the subcontinent, to the national and state boards formed during the earlier years of independence, and now the new national education policy. Other countries have also undertaken various initiatives that suit their requirements. However, there are commonalities that transcend the national boundaries. Every country at the end of the day wishes to have an education system that delivers strong, upstanding, future-ready citizens. It therefore stands to reason that globally, school education will also face a set of common challenges. Today, we dive into the depth of knowledge and expertise of our esteemed panelists and educators to understand some of these challenges better. To speak on this topic, our first speaker today is Mr. Philip Barrett. Mr. Barrett retired as the deputy headmaster from the illustrious Dune School in Dehradun after 44 years of serving in education across various institutions. He served the Dune School as housemaster, head of department, dean of activities, dean of student welfare, deputy headmaster, second master, and acting headmaster with great distinction. He also carried out a visioning exercise for the Dune School in the year 2011 through an in-depth study of a number of British public schools and various schools in the US. Mr. Barrett qualified as a leadership trainer at Wellington College UK in the year 2000. He's also an athlete, an adventurer, and a naturalist. And we at Notebook are privileged to have Mr. Barrett as our senior advisor. Sir, thank you so much for making the time to be here today. Over to you. Thank you very much, Bayou. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Perfectly, sir. And, uh, and, uh, and a very good evening to you and Achin, Abhishek, Gauri, Meghna. And you know, all at Notebook over there, as well as our esteemed panelists. Um, I must say that uh, the scope of this topic is so vast that I didn't know where to start. And so, you know, I'm going to handle a very small part of you know where I think we should be moving in order to be a global educational power. Um, you know, we recently celebrated a very impressive Republic Day, and um, where we displayed our you know, our military might and our cultural heritage, national diversity. But you know what, um, and, and while we have made great strides in these fields, I think that one of the greatest stresses and successes has been in the field of education. And, um, you know, at independence, our literary rate was supposed to be, I think, 12%. It currently stands at 74. Of course, the criteria for being literate is up for discussion. And, um, but nonetheless, we have made great progress. And we must not forget that at the time of independence, our population was, I think, 43 million. It's today, I think, 1.3 billion. So that, that, that's a big problem, our, our population. Um, it was obvious that the British had no intentions to educate us Indians. They had a few well-known residential schools in the hills where their officers' children were sent. The rest were sent back to England. Um, I read recently a foreword in a coffee, on a coffee table book uh, on the Anglo-Indians, written by um, the famous Anglo-Indian writer I. Alan Seeley. And he said that the Indians were taught English, not by the British, but by Anglo-Indian women sitting in railway colonies in, the, in, their, in their back verandas. And it's quite true. Uh, education in India is in the minds of everyone. Parents run helter-skelter to seek admissions in the best institutions they can afford, colleges, institutes of higher learning. Uh, there's a school for everyone. There are the village schools, no matter how dubious their value, the state-run schools, the regional institutions, the government schools, 
the private schools, the residential and military schools, and the compulsory education and the new education policy, um, you know, notwithstanding, I don't see why all children between the age of five and 13 cannot be in some sort of school getting a great education. Now, India, as Sabayu mentioned, has given the world the Guru Chela system, some of the oldest universities, Taksela, Nalanda, uh, Vikram Shila, Shanti Niketa. It also attracts the world by its, the science of yoga, classical dance, tribal arts, meditation centers, classical languages, Ayurveda. And we once boasted of great universities at centers like Aligarh, Bengal, Allahabad, Hyderabad, Banaras. The problem is that, you know, we have not been able to expand over the years. And, you know, we haven't added quality to our higher education. I wish we had grown uh, in the same rate, at the same rate as Hollywood, I mean, Bollywood or even cricket in India has grown, you know, grown out of proportion. Um, there is still a demand for the learning of traditional Indian skills. Um, but we need to open our schools and colleges uh, so that foreign students flock into India as a center of learning. Because while secondary education has grown at an alarming rate, with schools in every gully, street corner, hilltop, not to mention the numerous coaching centers, Kendra Vyadyalas, higher education seems to have been, you know, we can't keep pace. Even with the big players like the Tatas, Birlas, Ambani's, Modi's, Mahendra, Jindal Group, Thapas, Srirams, plethora of business houses and philanthropists, you know, the Amity Group, Pirmnada, Manipal, Symbiosis, all these people throwing money into education, we have still, we still seem to be moving slowly. At, you know, an Indian education system is some, one of the most rigorous in the world. Uh, we are proud of it. You know, I don't, see a, I don't see any sense in our kids going to study in English schools because I think they should be coming here because they have recognized our ah, Indian senior secondary certification. Our school education has depth. The curriculum is heavy, it's challenging. The problem is that the syllabus is not taught in modern ways. Many of our schools still encourage rote learning, note-taking, and copying from the text. Where the, where the international exams have scored over the national boards, and that is why so many IB and IGCSE schools have sprung up, is in the way the courses are taught, the manner in which these exams make students think and explore. They teach and produce learners, inquirers, risk takers, critical thinkers in a way that employers of tomorrow want. So while, you know, it's, you know, our IITs churn out engineers, but how much innovative work do these, people, these students do? How many patents do the IITs take out every year? I don't know. If our school system is to attract foreign students, as they do from neighboring countries like Korea, Africa, Middle East, we have to become global in outlook, more international in our syllabus, more progressive with our methodology. And while these, these um, you know, there's a place for our ancient traditions, we must be looking to educate the world of tomorrow. Foreign languages, robotics, you know, high tech stuff, digital printing, more technology, rather than the theoretical sciences of physics, chemistry, maths, more foreign exchanges, more collaboration with the best in the business. Another thing, I think our schools need to slowly go paperless. The pandemic has shown that turning to online education is a way forward, is, is really the way that we have to go. You know, co covering the syllabus more digitally, getting assignments done digitally, um, assessments done digitally. This is where we can show the world what we are capable of. And we, the need is to revamp our secondary education system in a way that the national education policy envisages, of course, to push, push more funds into education. We also need to have many, many more hundred IITs, law colleges, business schools, medical colleges, engineering colleges, places that we are proud of, like the Tata Institute of Science, the, 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 you know, the, the Indian Institute of Science, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, these are the places that we need to pr you know, pr proliferate over the years. Why is it that so many of our IIT graduates, engineering graduates, doctors and computer scientists who pass out from India go abroad? This brain drain is hurting the country. 
Indians had Google, Microsoft, IBM, Vimeo, Flex, Palo Alto Networks, Adobe, Twitter, GoDaddy. Amrita Sen is a master of Trinity College, Oxford. Why is it that they have to go abroad to become the Indians and to win Nobel Prizes? Which we have, we've got Booker Prizes, Nobel Prizes, we've got Pulitzer Prize winners. You know, leading departments and hospitals uh, are, are run by Indians abroad. They, do they have to go out for their value to be recognized? And this brain drain is because of the lack of quality institutions in our country, especially of higher education, where it is so difficult for our students to make the cutoff because the demand is so much more than supply. And not only does India export, you know, its brains to Silicon Valley and NASA, you know, Indian teachers too have taught in all corners of the world the Far East, the Middle East, Africa. It is Indian teachers who actually built the educational system in the Middle East. Dubai, you know, Muscat, Nauru, Nigeria, Ethiopia. Um, and what we need to do is to start off by putting teachers on a pedestal, giving them a quality standard of life. We, we refuse to pay the noblest of professions a decent wage. While Bhutan and you know, Finland have accepted this um, and pay their teachers equivalent to diplomats and bureaucrats in their country. It is sad to see our teachers having to do tuitions to make two ends meet. We must also attract the best brains in our, from our youth that come into education. Why must it be a last option choice? Uh, we don't spend enough on education. I think it's about 2.5 to 3.5% of our GDP. While the new education policy has uh, recommended about um, 6%. Um, we need to raise this. <clears throat> we rank 62nd in total expenditure on education per student, 62nd. The challenge lies in educating the masses. You know, in India, the, we are too diverse a country, diverse in geography, terrain, uh, language, uh, you know, um, culture. How can the farmer son in the Northeast do the same exam as a executive, uh, an IT executive in Hyderabad. We, we, we must have a different tier formation where the needs of different students are met. You can't have one exam in this country. We cannot have one exam suiting all. Teacher training too has to really be put on a backbone. We need to, to turn out quality teachers, quality school leaders. It's all very well to have teachers. What about headmasters and principals? They need to be trained to do the job. It's not just the senior most teacher becomes a head. I think it's a profession in its own right. We need much more high-tech education. Yes, the BA uh, is not enough. Um, <clears throat> you know, um, I think that we need to export our digital knowledge. You know, while we run the world's digital centers, why, why can't we have it here? Um, we see foreigners come to study in India, and we need to develop those areas where they, where they come in. India must offer an affordable quality education with scholarships uh, and the opportunity for foreigners to come here and, uh, and, and flood our institutions. Contrary to public perception that only we go abroad to study, India receives about 50,000 foreign students uh, at the undergraduate and higher levels. Of course, most of them are men. Uh, we need to improve our facilities. We need to improve our safety. We need to get more students coming to study in India. Now, <clears throat> of course, Karnataka is the, I believe the highest, uh, it, it has a state with the highest amount of foreign students coming in for graduate studies. And why is it that they must come from Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Sudan, Bhutan, Nigeria, Yemen? We must get students from the Western world, from everywhere. Um, I think uh, we also must realize that <clears throat> India must emerge as a leading education center. Just like you have medical tourism, we need to open our doors for the best in the world to come here. Uh, we need to build and maintain institutions of quality like Harvard, Yale, MIT, Oxford, Cambridge, Hong Kong, if they can break into the top 200 universities in Asia, why can't we? 
I think our highest ranking university, I think was 200th in Asia, if I'm not mistaken. We need to stress not on the number of schools we open each year, but on the quality of these institutions. We need thousand more Dune schools, thousand more Lamartnias. We need every village in Uttarakhand to have quality education. Of course, having said that, uh, you know, people say that we, we, we receive 50,000 students a year uh, over here, but we send out about 700,000 to study abroad. Why should, we, why should this be the case? I, I want to stop here uh, um, because I, I look forward to the views of the panel, to Achin, who's always so well researched. Um, thank you very much for listening to me. <clears throat> I hope I have opened a little chink in this very vast topic. Um, op and now over to you, Shubhayu. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for such a beautiful introduction to this topic. Going in, we realized we were tackling something fairly large here. But sir, I think you resonated everybody's hope in saying that India will emerge as a superpower that will attract students across all levels of education from all corners of the world. Thank you so much for that starting. Thank you, Shubhayu. Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is Ochin Bhattacharya. Ochin is the founder and CEO at Notebook. A chartered accountant by training, Ochin was a director at Deloitte prior to starting Notebook. He has worked in India and abroad in various senior capacities in GE, PwC, KPMG, and Deloitte. Ochin is a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales, a fellow of the ICAI, and a member of CPA Australia and CPA Ireland. He is also the recipient of the prestigious Indian Achievers Award. Ochin is an avid reader and a passionate traveler with keen interests in economics, history, literature, and philosophy. He's a regular speaker at various forums and chambers of commerce, and also contributes articles to numerous publications regularly. He is also on the board of some of the most renowned corporates and contributes significantly to their brand strategies. Ashim, over to you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, should I am audible? Yeah, sir. loud and clear. I once again welcome all of you to today's session. Let me start with a very, uh, very important information. For the past two years, United Nations Educational, Scientific and Culture Organization, which is UNESCO, developed a report to define international education goals. And the report is titled, Reimagining our futures together, a new social contract for education. And it identifies uh, key issues that all countries around the globe should focus on in terms of their educational systems. According to the report, I was, I was uh, going to uh, some portions of the report and I found this very relevant that according to the report, the main problems we are trying to fix, and this is again global. And then after, after of course, very, very detailed research and survey, the main problems we are trying to fix are climate change, uh, democratic backsliding, growing social inequality, and growing social fragmentation. And the most interesting part comes now. The report is saying that this is the business of educational institutions. So it explains how important these institutions are in terms of shaping of our civil society. If you look at things from a more holistic perspective, and I was reading about uh, what uh, the director for uh, Global Education Innovation Initiatives said, Fernando Ramos at uh, Howard University and member of UNESCO's Commission on the Future of Education, who was one of, the, one of the principal architects of the report. He said that, and, and this is really interesting. He said that unless educational institutions intentionally align what they do with these four challenges 
our future as humanity is in peril and what are the four challenges that we discussed about of course to start with climate change a democratic backsliding growing social inequality and growing social fragmentation and he feels that future of entire humanity is in peril unless and until education institutions are aligned and the report uh, it's very relevant because it comes very shortly after cop 26 summit in which 200 countries approved a, a un broker that critics say of course uh, fall short of a limited limited global warming because delegates really struggled to resolve major points you know major points of differences uh, points like uh, phasing out of coal naturally developed countries and developing countries they had huge difference of opinion fossil fuel subsidies financial support to low income countries but just after this summit of 200 countries unesco comes up with this observation that okay these are four challenges we have highlighted which which we feel are the most major challenges and only educational institutions can solve these challenges to help address uh, climate change the author goes a step further and he and he also said that research universities should partner with elementary middle and high schools to develop curriculum for the next generation of climate scientists and should open access to available research and data so imagine the kind of importance that unesco feels that schools have in this entire ecosystem so it feels that research institute should partner with schools you know to identify these issues and it mentions that in a society that is governed by law individuals shouldn't resort to violence to resolve their differences because of course what we have seen in recent past number of countries you now have regimes who you know see no problems in using violence as an instrument to maintain political control and to advance political ideas of course in a global context what we have seen in afghanistan what we have seen in number of places and of course that means that the end of the world that was built after world war 2 and here the most important point is that in today's era of globalization we all are interlinked to an extent that if something happens in, in, in afghanistan in kabul staying here in mumbai delhi or calcutta we are impacted so thus uh, unesco feels as for this report that you know it, it's really important because stakes are very high if we want the human rights to actually mean something and not only lip service we better examine whether we are preparing our students to understand these rights and to live in a manner that these rights actually have any reality in their own lives thus say for example things like uh, i was going to some portions of the report and some very wonderful observation like for instance including topics of human rights in curriculum so topics which are defined by united nations in 1948 charter could help education systems around the world avoid you know last two challenges that we discussed about democratic backsliding and social fragmentation so it is very important that educational institutions help individuals think about purposes bigger than themselves one is of course you know uh, grades and getting admission to you know a good institutions of choice career of course wonderful it is important there's no doubt about it but then again in equal breath what is important is that individuals you know our next generation be shaped up in such a way that they are, that, that they are groomed to think about purposes which are bigger than themselves not as an idea but as a practice to help students understand that the business of addressing climate change is our business that the business of making democracy work is our business that the business of growing inequality is everybody's business the truth is we have a curriculum and we have the knowledge about how to develop these capabilities in children and also if we take a step back and you know we we self introspect that what is the purpose of education in 21st century as 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 recently as going to a news report and a very a uh, very uh, interesting incident which which to me is very thought provoking i came across 
and I'd like to share with all of you. Recently, uh, Wisconsin go governor, a state in US, Scott Walker, he recently tried to change the century old mission of the University of Wisconsin by proposing and, and this is and so this one incident actually highlights the entire entire journey change in terms of our thought process in terms of our approach and this may be one sample but if, if you look at it by proposing to remove words in the state code that command the university because earlier uh, in the state code there are words like search for truth improve the human condition so these two, uh, these two, you know, phrases. One is search for truth, and second is improve human conditions. The governor proposed that let us replace them with meet the state's workforce needs. Uh, eventually, he backed off. There's a huge, uh, you know, uproar. A lot of intellectuals came together. The civil society came together. People, there's a lot of. Uh, uh, write-ups in the social media. Eventually, he backed off when the issue became public. Intense criticism from academics and, and from, from all quarters of the society. But the issue remains a topic of debate and discourse. Debate about whether the purpose of education you know, is, is such a debate that never seems to end. Should young people become educated to get prepared to enter the workforce or should the purpose of education be focused on more social, academic, cultural, and intellectual development so that students can grow to be engaged citizens. With each new workforce development, each new workforce development that we see, you know, or, or, or economic competitiveness demand on our K-12 schools, because this is, is really important, very, very important, you know, the foundation years. There has, been, there has been a pushback from those who want greater emphasis on a, on, a, on a broader view of education. But the way I look at it, it doesn't have to be, a, it doesn't have to be a either or on. Education should prepare young people for life, work, and citizenship. Equally important, of course, there's no doubt about it. There can never be a life without a livelihood. Equally important. But at the same time, a more holistic development, a, you know, preparing citizens, to, uh, preparing children to be more engaged citizens, I think is equally important, very, very important. So not only of the natural and, and, and engineered environments and how people live in the world is critical to all three purposes of education. And when I see all three purposes, of course, critical thinking, creativity, and interpersonal skills. And a sense of, and a sense of social responsibility, you know, and all these things influence success in life. Success in life, work, citizenship. For example, unhappy personal relationships often spill over into the work environment. And vice versa, of course. Stressful workplace or unemployment or underemployment naturally will negatively affect family life. So uninformed, disengaged citizens will lead to poor policy choices that impact life, work, and citizenship. So I remember that uh, verse in the, in the old song, that 1999 album, it's about time. You can't have one without the other. So this, this, this multi, multiple purpose perspective has practical implications for both day-to-day -day instruction as well as education policy. So what are the classroom features that support for life, work, and citizenship? We are discussing about global challenges in education. What are the global challenges? So I think the key is to identify uh, the learning behavior in engaged. I remember, I remember uh, Nelson Mandela once said that education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. Very, very, uh, of course, we, you know, we all agree with this. But one really wonders what you would have made of the response to the education crisis triggered by COVID-19 pandemic. And today, again, if we discuss at a global scale, a crisis threatening to derail social and economic progress. 
trapping millions of children in poverty. Millions. The UN Secretary General has warned, and to quote, of a generational catastrophe. That is the extent of impact. Yet the international response has been marked by staggering complacency. Today, if you look at, you know, if you look at educational budgets around the world, budget cards, if you look at how, you know, what kind of steps taken, of course, educators around the world have done a phenomenal job, gone out of their way, tried their best to ensure children don't lose a year. But again, COVID-19 has layered a new crisis on old problems. Because before the pandemic, more than 250 million children were out of school. Not that being in school was an automatic passport to learning. More than half of in olds if you, if you look at Pisa survey, attending primary school in the poorest of countries, if you, look, if you look at African countries, remain unable to read a simple sentence or solve a basic maths problem. And, and these are published data. These children, many of them, first generation learners, were and are being failed by school systems designed to act as, a, as you know, for, for rote, rote learning, memorizing. And here again, we are discussing on a global scale. For hundreds of millions of children on the wrong side of digital divide that, we have, that has become so apparent, especially during the last one and a half years, classroom closure ended learning. The pandemic has uh, dramatically widened gaps in global education. So I was reading that uh, UNESCO wants that lost learning in 2020 could eliminate the gains made over two decades. So over the last two decades, whatever gains we made as, 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 as a society, everything could be eliminated in low and lower middle income countries. And that's where the maximum need is. The World Bank estimates that the number of 10 year olds unable to read or write in these countries could rise to Meanwhile, the lethal interaction of, of, of rising child poverty and learning losses could leave an additional 24 million children out of school, with many forced into child labor or early marriages. Now, these are not theoretical risks. We are not discussing about theoretical risks in pen and paper. Instance, if, I, if I give you a real example, for instance, rural primary school children in Ethiopia have lost 70% of their predicted learning. According to surveys, recently, this was done by University of Cambridge and Addis Ababa, 70% loss. Now, of course, while many governments around the world responded to school closure by introducing ambitious uh, distant learning initiative, still the reach at a global scale has been fairly limited. For hundreds of millions of children on the wrong side of digital divide, many living in urban slums or with parents who, who themselves are not so fortunate. These children are first generation learners with very little support at home. Classroom closure ended learning. And that I think is very unfortunate. But yes, there are, there are uh, I'll say humongous effort and there are some excellent initiatives being taken. I was reading about, uh, uh, I was reading about uh, the fact that uh, students from uh, Harvard and Stanford launched an international education challenge very recently to encourage students to get involved in global issues during the COVID pandemic called the Crown Education Challenge, named derived from the English, English translation of the word, you know, Corona. It invites uh, elementary, middle, and high school students around the world to submit original artwork, writing, scientific research, centered around the theme of hope during a pandemic. So these are, of course, you know, very, 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 very optimistic events. So these are some thoughts that I wanted to share with all of you. I sincerely thank all of you for giving me a very patient hearing. I think Bharat sir made a wonderful start, given his decades of experience. And as, as I think sir very rightly mentioned, it's a, it's a very vast topic, huge topic. And I think I only tried... Uh, covering a very limited portion of it, maybe from, from more from a you know, holistic perspective, from a, from a global perspective. We have a wonderful panel here today, a very experienced and eminent panel. And I really look forward to hear from them, their views uh, on this particular topic. I thank all of you again. Over to you, Shubhai. 
Thank you, Ochin. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as Ochin mentioned, we do have a fantastic panel lined up for you. But before we go on to the panel discussion, a little bit about us here at Notebook. We at Notebook are an edtech platform. We create short videos pertaining to the school curriculum. Now, these videos are useful in two different ways. One is when you as an educator are starting a class, whether it's online or offline, you can use these short videos as a method of visually introducing the topic to your students. Out of your 40 minute period, these videos take up just six or seven minutes, but give your students a great way of imagining the various things that you'd be talking about. The other way in which these videos are useful is that the students have access to the same videos on their personal devices, whether it's a smartphone or a laptop or whatever device that they have access to, they can access these same videos there time and again. So they can watch the videos over and over again before an exam or an upcoming test and not only get a clearer idea about the topic, but also get reminded of what you taught in class the day you had What I'm gonna do now is play you snippets from some of the notebook videos so that you know better what it is that I'm going on and on about. क्षण मनुष्य अपने गंतव्य पथ पर थका हुआ नजर आ रहा है वह उसकी हिम्मत बढ़ाने के लिए कहते हैं कि तू कभी थक नहीं सकता तू कभी रुक नहीं सकता तात्पर्य यह है कि यदि मनुष्य थक के बैठ गया तो उसे कभी भी मन दिस इज चित्रगुप्त द अकाउंटेंट ऑफ गॉड्स माइथोलॉजी सेज दैट ही इज द असिस्टेंट ऑफ यमा द किंग लुई द 16 had come to power in in 1774 at only 20 years of age he was inexperienced and was married to the austrian princess mary antoinette the king helped the 13 at the age of 12 he went to school to learn the hindu scriptures 4 years later he returned home married a princess and had a son at the age of 25 prince siddhartha came in contact with the sufferings of the world when he went out for hunting how oh. let's go to the mitochondria now it provides energy for everything you do throughout the day next is the nucleus the brain of the cell this is where edison was curious about a hen which was sitting on its eggs his mother told him that chickens would hatch from the eggs edison was a funny He wanted to do self. He sat on a dozen eggs, but of course he could not hatch them. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was just very short snippets of some of the notebook videos. If you head over to our website www.notebook.school or use our mobile apps, you will have access to over ten thousand such videos for your teaching advantage. It is now my privilege to introduce the wonderful panel. that we have with us today we are privileged to have with us mr tsr sastri who holds a msc a ba a pgdca and an adcp he has an experience of 35 years in the field of education working in various capacities he started his career back in 1987 working as a pgd mathematics at hcl dav public school hyderabad he then worked as a master of mathematics at sainik school korkonda and went on to work as the head of middle and secondary school in the middle east for a period of 8 years out of which 7 years he was at the millennium school dubai and he in doha qatar head master before moving to india again he worked as the principal of a school run and managed by the kesoram cement industries basandnagar which is part of the birla group and is currently working as the principal of the defense laboratory school rci hyderabad since 2014 sir has conducted various workshops to teachers of different schools in the middle east and has been instrumental in introducing cbsc international curriculum at tms dubai and bps doha he has also conducted workshops to the teachers and heads of different schools of doha for the implementation of cbsc international curriculum he is also a resource person for various cbp programs conducted by coe kakinada in cce mathematics remodeled assessment classroom management career guidance and counseling ethics and integrity in schools life skills etc So thank you so much for making the time to be here today it's our privilege to have you on the panel we are also privileged to have with us uh, ms khushboo singh who is the principal of the angel english medium school in pune 
She's a principal and a successful administrator for over 15 years, alongside being a passionate writer. She has been deeply immersed in curriculum creation, contemplative pedagogy, in-depth evaluation of several curricula to arrive at the best practices in teaching learning, content creation, and educational research. For her, it has been a continuous passionate attempt to delve deep into the minds of the learners and make learning a truly joyful journey. Starting from the formative years of kindergarten to high school, she has looked at the learning patterns across a wide age group of students. Leading teams and creating a successful work culture has been there. She collaboratively created passionate teams with great visions and learned to build budding institutes from scratch to success. She has been writing on meaningful topics and it is a part of the story that defines her. She enjoys playing with words and looks forward to future learning, growth and opportunities in the field of education. Thank you so much for sparing the time to be here today. We are privileged to have you here. We also have with us Mr. Vivid Gupta, who is the principal of the Bal Bhavan Public School, Mayuriyar Phase 2, Delhi. He aims to empower his educators to perform to the best of their proficiencies and edging along with the advancements of times and techniques. He's a self-motivated and self-driven individual with respect for taking initiatives towards the social concerns and causes and a contributor in the developing positive mindsets in uplifting society. He's committed to redefining the conventional phase of education and is consistently working in the direction of fostering 21st century global learners. He has been catering to the unique and unconventional academic perceptions, and he believes this would promote inquisitive acumen in the youngsters. Creating room for exploration, he's charting out a navigation course to foster change makers. He has worked to establish a team of motivated mentors, incarnating an institution that defines the essence of innovative spirit and creativity. Being an ardent advocate of innovation and skills and spirit, his leadership techniques are marked by enthusiasm of exploring different avenues of knowledge, creating room for experimentation and innovation. Under his able mentorship, the school has been awarded the School of Innovation Trophy 2021 for maximum participation at the Youth Ideathon. The school is adding bounties of accolades under his leadership, where the teachers and students are recognized in multi-dimensional facets. His passion and commitment to allow students to explore, innovate, and experiment is unparalleled. Sir, thank you so much for being here today. It's a privilege to have you on the panel. I would now request all the panelists to please unmute yourselves and switch on your cameras. I shall stop my share and do the same. Once again, a very good evening and welcome to the panel. It's a privilege to have all of you here. Good evening. Good evening. Mr. Shastri, Thank sir. you for inviting us here. Good. Yeah, good evening. Good evening, sir. Very good evening to everyone. Good evening. Uh, uh, Mr. Shastri, if you could please also switch on your camera. Thanks. I'm unable to see the screen, that's why. So we can't see. I think it's not. Uh, yeah, it's now OK. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Shasta, sir, my first question is actually uh, to you. And we would actually go around the table uh, for the other's inputs as well. It is, uh, we in India have the world's largest school education system in terms of number of students. Do we have challenges that are different from the rest of the world? Or do we form like a superset of challenges that you would find in school education? See, if you see our education system, it's uh, of a global standard, actually, I can say, because it's multidimensional, multifaceted, because we have different uh, type of students into the classrooms. It's not one type of situation because ours is a vast country having uh, more than uh, 25 to 30 different type of uh, states are there. And from there, different type of culture is there. Culture backgrounds are different. The things are different, everything. So we cannot go with a single type of uh, education. It should be in a different way, different pattern we have to make it out. So hence, uh, what are we doing? We have to be a global challenge. Just as for an example, when the pandemic came in, there are so many changes which has occurred. Even the teachers who are having 25 to 30 years of experience into only into the road learning method so within uh, almost I can say within a span of time a little span of time they switched over and then they are given the uh, proper education to the students now 
even though it's a uh, online or offline education because this is totally new to the, the people who are working in this in india in particular because we are totally new to these type of things but the, the teachers have changed over i can say even overnight that the change has happened and they could be able to just deliver and make the students the actually essence what they want at least not in a total uh, into the classroom environment but things has not stopped at that place where they are they have been moved up so definitely the ch challenges what are there the people are there to ready ready to go with this one because we have challenges whether it is a pandemic or this whatever is this one the challenges are many because our is uh, population is uh, it is a uh, quadruple and compared to the uh, last year over years and all it's quadruple it is not just like that to go because we uh, artificial intelligence is coming to the existence so the things has been changing moving we have to go with the missions we have to go with the missions not with just simple because there are places where the students are not having mobile but the government or the people has made the uh, tv as a as a medium of uh, uh, giving the instructions to the people so the challenges are many but we can face it but we will be the global people global we have to global who are the global contender not like just uh, stick down to only one place so we can do the thing because we are uh, our mindset is entirely different we can change we can change the total entire system of education but the new education policy because uh, it is not low learning alone the people needs now the skill education because what for we are studying actually what for we are having our education it is to see to to face the challenges the challenge has to be faced it is not just learning and then going for something a challenge that's why the blue spirit exam is also this the evaluation change has been replaced with the creativity the people has to know the creativity the, the how to go with their it is not just remembering or learning or understanding from there what is the next step how to go with applying how to go with the creativity what are the new challenges which you can face because the uh, the, uh, the things are not stopping at one stage they are changing a lot there is changes are going there. so definitely we are there we will be definitely making we can be the global players in this field thank you that's what i want to say from my voice it is my experience and all thank you, thank you, thank you so much sir we benefit from the years of experience that you had both in india and abroad uh, ma'am if i may come to you next uh, what we are really trying to ascertain is we have we are today trying to talk about global challenges of education but india as a country has challenges and problems that are very unique to india right do you feel that there are certain global problems that we do not see or we are so big and so diverse that any problem in any corner of the world of it at home so the i am going to speak about speak on very sensitive issues now which i think i should not mention now but the, what india is facing the challenge as what i have come up with we all do say the preamble and we talk about equality at the same time when the children those who are growing up and going to the college to take the admission they are struggling because of the casteism and this is the main problem india is struggling with i hope you all would agree we don't speak on this topic but what actually is happening if you go to take the admission in mbbs they will first of all ask you about your category based on that percentage and then you happen to get the admission where in x y z category is getting the admission at 50% of marks in standard 12 where in x y z category is not getting the admission even after scoring 92% of marks there are many news articles i have been through i have read and this makes me sad at the same time when we talk about global education i don't think so this is there in other countries what we are following so what we teach to our children what we put on the first page of the textbook and we talk about preamble we are not actually doing that or following that so this is what india as you said something unique so this is what the india is lacking behind if you talk about equality and if equality is given to everyone there should be uniformity in taking the admission 
that you have not made the uniformity in the collection of fees. The fees changes if you are in different category. Your admission procedure of the college changes if you are in different category. Since you have asked me a very small incident I would share before 10 years when I was working as a class teacher in one of the schools, I happened to ask children about their parents' qualification during the filling of the form. What I found there was when child is saying my father is 10th fail, but that father was working as a manager in SBI. It struck me and I happened to call the parent and asked him, that, sir, excuse me, the child is saying this. I don't think so since you are having this officer post in the government bank and the child is mentioning this in the form. Can you please throw a little light on that? And then the parent could answer, no, we are in this, 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 this category wherein we are filling the form and we get the job. I felt so sorry for my country if we are talking about the global challenges as what the topic is given to us. At the same time, we are not appointing the right candidate just because of this system which we are following. So I don't think so that as what well, do we have different challenge from the rest of the world? Yes, we do have. And that is, there should be equality in everything. So I hope you all agree with me. Yeah. Yes, so. Well, thank you so much for shedding light on that. But I think this harks back to what Bharat sir was speaking earlier. It's at the end of the day, a supply demand situation reservation or any kind of preferential treatment is necessary if there's no inadequate supply. Make supply adequate, make every single engineering college this level of, let's say the top three in the country, and you have completely removed that problem. And I think that's what we are striving towards. But thank you so much for highlighting that, ma'am. Mr. Gupta, sir, if I may come to you next. Yes. Uh, so across urban rural India, we already have like very, very diverse set of challenges, right? On one hand of the spectrum, you have schools which are struggling to get even one screen in place for 60 students or even two rooms for two different classes. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, schools cannot get enough of you know, uh, the high-tech devices, the best of online learning or even foreign trips and foreign collaborations. Uh, right. So do you see this diversity as an advantage or a disadvantage? Uh, so I think uh, since the beginning of the... Um, uh discussion we've been talking about the divide uh, whether the divide is uh, at the um, you know city level you know where, where we see that we are a heterogeneous country and we are talking about tier one tier two and tier three uh, cities and villages and how the education system is prevailing at different levels um, be it the school level education or the higher education level at both level we've seen the uh, problem problems are there we are struggling with our own uh, scenario then if we talk about the digital divide so there are there is a group of students who is struggling to you know uh, get the devices and internet at at place so that they are able to uh, connect to the virtual classroom. However, there is a group of students and uh, parents who have everything in abundance, but the children are not attending the classes because they are completely uh, submerged into gaming and there is an excess of everything available to them. So you know there is a kind of divide in our scenario in our country. And uh, to, to uh, what ma'am has just mentioned here, when we're talking about uh, the inequality that is prevailing in our society, I, uh, and also as uh, you know, uh, Mr. Achin Bhattacharya has mentioned, that we are talking about the equality and we, uh, the education is the only gateway that will open uh, the events where we can ensure that equality and equity is sustained. So that is something that we have to focus on at the moment. Uh, I personally feel that in our country, uh, you know, when we are talking about the um, divide, it is also because of the politics, political issues that are concerning us. So today, when we, we see that one city or one state is uh, allowing the children to enter the school physically, however, there are certain states where the children are still uh, sitting at home and uh, just carrying on for the, with the virtual classes. So that kind of a scenario is uh, not allowing our country to grow in, in leaps and bounds. And I should be mentioning that um, uh, it, they're, they're, that that is further uh, creating a divide. And as also mentioned earlier, that whatever the learning loss has happened in the past one and a half years, uh, that is equivalent to whatever we have attained in the uh, two decades. And we are we're just going to roll back. So it is something which we need to talk about. It is something where we need to unite our thoughts. We need to come at a consensus that now it is the time to open up the school. Everything is open. You know, you talk about the malls, you talk about theaters, you talk about 
the offices only the area that is uh, in gray and which is in dim light is the education sector why so so when we when unesco is saying when um, un is saying that we want the education to prevail for equality and sustainability then why is it that the uh, senior leaders of the country are not able to understand the need that this physical school should open so if we are talking about the challenge today it is certainly the first very first challenge is we want the children back in the school once that problem is sorted we can certainly figure out what is next but that is the priority today the children you know uh, we had a ptm this morning and i was um, you know really not happy with the uh, percentage of parents who attended the ptm today because they say that we are watching what is happening in the classroom and uh, we cannot force the children uh, to attend the classes because uh, you know of the uh, health issues that uh, might come up because of the um, uh, too too long screen time or maybe you know because of the uh, inability of the devices but at the same time they want the child to write the examination and why the child is writing the examination is because that certification is something which is the uh, passport to get the employment so that is something that we need to talk about today are we providing education or we are ha having children in the school only because we want to create a generation of um, you know um what should i say labeled literates whereas um, in actual sense they are not educated so you know we need to understand the purpose of education who is accountable needs to be answered and once we figured that out i think our problem the divide will be over and we will be progressing ahead as a nation who is going to have the foreign students as uh, mr uh, bert was talking about so i think that vision can only uh, be achieved once we are all together national education policy 2020 is very beautiful it is certainly very beautiful it is talking about everything it is talking about the rights of the children it is talking about the teachers training everything is in place but when it comes to the implementation tier 1 tier 2 tier 3 cities we need to take everything into alignment and we need to ensure who needs what and accordingly provide them then only that equity that balance will come in otherwise we'll keep shouting and we keep uh, screaming about equity and equality we will not be able to achieve that so that's my uh, personal uh, view on uh, the global challenges and currently what we are as a nation what we are facing wonderful sir thank you so much uh, just as you know this is the 152nd episode and uh, our learning over these you know two year long experience that we've had with together for education is that education is so much beyond what could possibly ever be done on any digital platform there's so much of holistic development personality development etc involved that you cannot do without a certain amount of pulse to echo everybody's uh, thoughts when you say you want the students back in the school trust me half the students want to be back in the school as well they have had enough of their parents sitting in their classrooms uh ma'am if i may come to you uh, now that we have all of us agree that this exists in this vast diversity now around the world if i have to look at countries big and small right on one hand you have the extremely developed high gdp countries which have their own set of problems which are fairly uniform if the country has a lower population than ours and on the other end of the spectrum you have the asia pacific islands and small countries in africa which have a very very small economy and therefore their challenges are sort of like our tier 3 cities right can we not become a global hub not just in terms of education attracting students from out, outside the country but attracting teachers saying that they want to come here they want to learn how we tackle these problems do you see that as a possibility is this for me yes ma'am uh so so addressing this problem that having the teachers from different countries to our country sir the set the curriculum which we make there is a difference because having worked in international baccalaureate school i know the procedure and the curriculum and the teaching teaching procedure is totally different wherein the cbse works in different manner and so as the different states are right so if we are hiring a teacher from different school to uh, sorry different country to our country they will take time to understand it first of all and now as per new uh, nep 2020 as what i have gone through i was uh, the member of the discussion of nep 2020 with the indian, uh, indian principal network 
as what we had discussion is nowadays what nep has done that nep has picked up simply few steps or you can say few things from the international baccalaureate book and they have put up here and that is what is integrated with the music integrated with this integrated with samagra siksha and many more things so if we are hiring a teacher from another country to india they need to actually learn they need to understand the situation on ground level they need to understand the new patterns which we have uh, which has come into existence which you know the devil implementation of nep is the very big task for the teachers lots of planning uh, time a lot of collaboration with the different teachers sitting together planning it out how to execute it many things are there so the, if we are getting the teachers is well and good that we are actually getting uh, teachers from abroad wherein the nep has actually uh, picked a few things from there as well so yes the thing if someone comes here to india and they are coming to teach they need to first of all understand if they are coming to maharashtra that will be totally different scenario if they are going to delhi that is different scenario if they are going to odisha there will be a different scenario you know they need to understand the root level what exactly the problem is they need to set themselves according to the situation and then they can proceed further so yes we can have the teachers i had few teachers with me in my school wherein they were having they were saying that they are facing the problem of mentality indian mentality indian parents orthodox mentality you know you know by the way parents are parents they will come up with many issues so for them it is quite difficult to solve it all right yes sir, over to you thank you thank you so much for that uh, mr gupta sir uh, same question but i was not exactly looking at it from the point of view of getting them hired here but over the last few years at least when travel was open teachers from around the world were being taken to finland to be shown as this model of education that they could possibly replicate now can we do something like that for indian education because we do cover a wide spectrum so uh, thank you for that question uh, mr roy uh, what i have i have i see this particular question from a different perspective altogether so uh, not from the hiring of teachers you know foreign teachers into our, our schools because as ma'am has put up i think it is very appropriate to say that probably they will not be able to understand our scenarios and our needs and then you know uh, what our children want they will not be able to reciprocate that in the classroom however to bring in the global perspectives it is very important to remain connected with the world and uh, you know the pandemic has opened that um, avenue for us that those doors to us and we are now collaborating with schools overseas uh, through the skype sessions through the uh, you know different platform that are available to us and that that collaboration wherein we are able to see what other schools are doing globally and what we are doing and then the taste that our children are getting in the classroom sitting here with an indian teacher but also understanding how the same thing can be dealt with uh, at a different uh, level and then bringing those perceptions into the classroom and then having the discussion around it that will definitely enhance the students uh, global perspective which is definitely the need of the time uh, again if you are talking about the teacher training and the visit of teachers to the foreign land uh, to uh, study the uh, you know um, education system in finland or maybe in uk or in australia i think we are very very progressive in that regard especially in tier 1 uh, cities like delhi uh, where we are having uh, opportunities the delhi government has opened up venues for teachers to go out and understand the education system and what we can bring into our system like you know the national education policy is centered around certain uh, areas which are highlighted in the uh, ib curriculum like ma'am has also mentioned here so you know when we are talking about art integration or we are talking about hands on experiential learning if we are talking about uh, multidisciplinary project work i think that is the need of the time and even if uh, you know national education policy uh, would not have been here uh, the pandemic would have definitely uh, forced us to change our perspectives and uh, adopt that kind of a strategy and pedagogy in our classroom so this is something which i really advocate and i really wish that we are able to provide Uh, an environment to our children where uh, they become global leaders so when we are talking about global leaders we don't want the children to go out of the country and become leaders over there but we want them to lead from the country and lead the world so the best of the ceos are uh, from india so we should not forget that but at the same time we need them here also so if they are able to master it from here i think that will that will be the way forward thank you wonderful thank you thank you so much for that uh, mr shastri sir i reserved you for last on this question because eight years you've seen schools being built up in dubai in doha 
uh, with Indian teachers. A lot of those teachers are Indian, but you've also had to handle multicultural setup within your teachers. How does such a situation work? Do you have learnings from the Indian education system that really hold water there? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. The school where I worked in uh, Dubai, we had teachers from different different countries, not only Indians, because our setup is an Indian system, Indian school system. But things are the some of the subjects which are related to that, like Arabic and the Islamic studies and the uh, other subjects, they used to hide the teachers from Egypt or uh, Sud uh, Sudan, like that. So, but the thing here is. Whichever is the country in, uh, coming in, the thing is the people they need to understand the student's behavior, student understanding. Then only the things will be will definitely get into this one. There are schools where I work where we have eighty different nationalities, students, students eighty different nationalities. But when we are adapting to them, we should not go with the same strategy. What we do. With our country people, because the mindset up of our students, our parents are entirely different when compared to the mindset up of different other country. Definitely, we have to follow different strategies to go with that type of people. Because some country, uh, I can say the people from Iraq, Iran, and all, they are very aggressive in the class wars. They're very very aggressive. So we have to deal with that type of people in a different way. The platform should differ. Same way, because at the end of the day, we need the people to learn, the children to learn. That's the ultimate idea. The ultimate thing is they have to learn something what you are teaching. So when we have different perspective in this way, we have to adapt to the methods which are needed for that one. Even if you are calling the people from the other country to hear, whether that is a teacher or is one, because we need to train those people. They have to get trained themselves. To adapt to the situation where we are in. See, if you if a teacher teaches at twelfth class, twelfth class, and we suddenly make him to teach class one, what he should do? He should definitely adapt to the level of a class one child. He cannot teach at the level of the class twelfth. Same is the case here. When we are bringing a person from the other country, so we he need to adapt to the system. It may take some time, but he has to get trained in that one. This is the behavioral problem. These are the behavioral changes. What you need, you see difference between your country people and our country people because we know the mindset up of uh, each and every individual is not same. It is different in different perspectives. Because that's why when we are talking about bringing the teachers, we, they have to be trained in the way they into whether it is the, as a. Uh, I, I just don't remember. Mr. Squid Bush old, but each state has different different strategies. They are not same because people from Bihar, students from Bihar, are different from the people who are in Uttar Pradesh, who are in Andhra. They are not different because st student behavior we can see because it is not same even in India itself. So what what you talk about the foreign countries? So when we are into the particular system. Being international, we need to make them understand the situation before putting them into the school. So they have to get trained, or they can come to us, learn what are the ins and outs of a different type of uh, strategies which are followed in India, and they can take that as their input, and they can adapt into their country. Thereby, they can change their globally. They can meet the global challenges. So that method will be very useful. That's all what I think. Wonderful, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Mr. Gupta, I'll come to you with the last question. Uh, we are today talking about the digital divide. Yes, going digital has thrown up a new set of challenges for the education system. And we have this as a question from some of our members in the audience as well, saying, what can we as educators do to kind of bridge the digital divide? Is there a way to surmount this challenge that something we as schools, we as educators can do? So uh, I think it's a very, very important question that we need to answer today. And I personally feel that when we are talking about the divide as a school, uh, what we can do is we need to understand the situation of each individual student. And then, you know, guidance is something which is very, very important. So uh, I personally feel that there is a lack of guidance in our environment. 
we try to see education you know uh, the question that i asked in the beginning who is accountable we need to understand that is it only the school principal is it the class teacher uh, is it the parents is it the child himself so all four or five uh, stakeholders of the child's education everybody is accountable and we need to understand that and all these stakeholders have to you know jointly take an effort where things can happen school cannot do it alone if you tell me you know as a school principal you take an effort and ensure that this divide goes away i'm sorry i cannot do it i don't have the power because if the child is not willing the parent is not willing the teacher is not willing how will i be able to do it i can only plan things the what i will need is i will need the support of the teacher i will need the appreciation from the parent i will need the child to understand that it is for him so this is something which is very very important the, you know when you're talking about education i personally feel that in our country uh, education is not seen as an investment it is seen as an expense and once you know as as educators as teachers as parents as children we understand that this is not an expense you are investing your life into it not only money you are investing your 14 years in the school you are investing your 3 years in graduation programs so what is it so our children are absolutely unaware of what they want to be and why the reason is because we are running ahead with host of curriculum preparing the children to write the examination qualify that and move to the next level and at the end of the day what do we get we are not having skilled population today the employers are looking for skilled population be it a school you know as a as a school principal as a recruiter of teachers what we want from the teacher is that you understand you have passion for this particular job you need to come back to us and tell us that you know i can teach physically i can teach virtually and i am ready and i'm i'm ready to take all the challenges but at the end of the day if a teacher come back to uh, will would come back to me and tell me that you know my students are not able to respond they are not able to join what should i do i am not here to guide you for that you need to understand that you know as a teacher what is your role how far could you go and how can you ensure that your children are joining in the virtual classes what is the problem identifying that at the ground level is the first thing that we need to do so i feel as an individual everybody has their own role to play and once everything gets synchronized things are sorted our our challenge our divide will be over and we will be able, able to overcome it Shubhai, you are there. If I may come to you, I know you are typing an answer. Yeah, I am right here. Uh, yeah. Guys, sorry, you. my connection was unstable for us a little bit. Not uh, I was seeing you were almost typing the answer to a question, but I would actually prefer that you give the answer to everybody. It's a very interesting question. It says today, when virtual reality and artificial intelligence are having their roots embedded in education sector, how important is it to focus on personal resilience and emotional intelligence? Ma'am, I'll leave that to you to answer. I saw that, and since few days, I'm thinking I'm going class to class personally, and I'm talking about resilience. Sir, happened to uh, turn the pages of newspaper and saw that one girl committed suicide because some she was a bit fat. Another scene came. The child asked for the mobile phone, and the parent said, "No, I will not give you now. It may harm your eyesight." And the child committed suicide. one incident happened with one of my uh, teacher her son committed suicide last year because just mother was driving the scooter and the dupatta hang on to the neck and just the child wanted to experience what my mother has been through so in that case so what has happened now because of this the uh, children they all are locked in one room we can say that parents are working from home they don't have time for the children where in the physical activities are stopped so full day they are happen to see the mobile phones and they're thinking we don't know who is thinking at what time where and where it is taking them to one of my students of 12th standard just day if today is the fourth day just jumped from the terrace down and i was shocked to hear that and happened to call the parent came to know that parent was single parent and uh the child felt something that no i should not leave my mother is struggling for me in this pandemic she is going and working for me and the child we can say what came to her mind and the child took this decision 
So as what you said about the resilience, I think this has come in the chat box, what I have seen. And this question is asked by Madam Lakshmi, or I will just have a look at the question again, sir. So what we can do here, it talks about personal resilience and emotional intelligence, sir. We should take a sessions for the children. As what I will mention the name of Miss Universe, what she has said that we should have self-confidence. Things are going to come, it will move on. But we have to be strong enough, have confidence in yourself. This too shall pass. Having that attitude, we should move on. It's not like if someone has told you fat, we should give up. If something is there, we should open up and go and share the things, what we are feeling. If I am feeling today down, I may go and I may talk to you or my friends. I will sit with them and I'll discuss this is what I'm being through. I'm feeling bad because someone, we should open up wherein nowadays children are not with the friends. They are spending more time with the parents. Parents are busy in working. They just simply give a phone. And I, I don't think so that what pops out in the phone at what time and what children is thinking about it. So we should have a session for the children where we should motivate them, even though they are sitting in the online class, the teacher should pamper and say, oh my God, come today, Dhruv, you are absent. Oh my God, you're looking so handsome. Handsome, Dhruv, just tell me what you have done. So some classes wherein we are engaging children positively, we are giving them tasks which are engaging them and they are doing some little research and they are encouraged to proceed to move further. And this thinking should be stopped. I have kept a class where I, we have kept coffee with mama, where the children are coming, sitting, and the mama comes and she takes the class and they all are sharing their secrets, uh, putting in the chat box. So at least they are expressing what they are feeling. So just for that, I think we should work upon, the school should take uh, initiative because nowadays the mental health is deteriorating the small children. And now and then whenever the turning pages of the newspaper happen to read this feeling so bad, I would now ask the opinion of Sastri sirs, you are very experienced. What do you say that nowadays children are not having that attitude? Definitely it they is, need a life know, skill education, madam. Unless until they are trained in the life skill education, or they were given sessions on this one, the students will uh, being alone in the house. These things are coming up because they are things are going in a different, different directions. Definitely the students need the life skill education, empathy, uh, towards other people and what what is the first thing is self they should know about themselves first. if they know about themselves things will come out in a different way they have to be expressive whatever they want to tell to the students to tell to their parents they have to be expressive because nowadays the parents are very busy with their own uh, uh, the jobs and all and whatever they are they, even the children are, because they are in the house coming to want to come some, tell something to them. They are unable to take because they are busy with their job work and all. But they have to lend their ear to the to children so that at least something they can tell out, express out. Then only these things will go out. Definitely life skill education is very, very important for the children in this pandemic situation because almost two years, they are not mingling with their own friends. The first thing, if they are in the classrooms, definitely the total things will be shared among their own friends, the close friends, everything. But now nobody is there to share. It's also in online. The sharing also is happening online. So better, they, they, they must have a life skill education. Then only things will be there. That's what I feel. Wonderful. I think this has been a fantastic discussion. Before we close, however, I want to go around the table. And I want to, you to name the top three things that you think that as the Indian school education system, we can export globally, right? Not our students, but as our methodology, as the problems that we face and the pro solutions that we have designed for it, right? What are the good three things the world could benefit from? Uh, Shastri, sir, if I may start with you. I, I did not get it, what you said. What you sir, as the Indian education system, if there are three good things, that we can export to the rest of the world, that the world can benefit from. If you feel that there are three, what would those three be? See, sir, our first thing, our education system 
the dead old our education system is a gurukula system of education wherein the skill education is very very important and we have in it in us it is not coming out but because it has been under now but it has to come out now so that is one thing where we are very good at the skill education because we are theoretically the best people in india so we can see in the year 2000 when the year 2000 problem came we are the people who solved at the global level at usc even though they are experts in the higher level but because ours was the y2k problem they used to call it that was solved because we are theoretically experts in the field so practically also now we are getting into so both together that the first thing which you have to put into the other people and our passion towards the education because we have our leaders who are very passionate like our apj abdul kalam ji and our survey pr radha krishna ji they are we are very passionate about because our gurukul system told us a thing we are we are into that one. you can see for the several thousands of years our vedas have survived it is not scripts they are coming out from that for that many years it is still alive it is not in scripts that's what the reason that is what our spiritual system of thinking that one thing the third thing we are peace lovers we are not the people who are going about all the things we are peace lovers we we can see over the so many years so many decades so many not only decades centuries sir we never fought with anybody directly unless in somebody came on us so that we are peace lovers these three things which i think are very very essential to tell the global people wonderful sir thank you so much for that kushbu ma'am the next so three things the first thing would be yoga which already modi ji has taken it further the second thing i would say sir the culture how we respect our elders we can say in terms of manners the way we treat our teacher now not like foreign countries hello hi and the way they behave with them so i can say culture <coughs> yoga and the third thing i would say that is our ancient language that is sanskrit so three things i would suggest uh we should take away from india to all or we can globalize these things in different countries yes sir over to you wonderful ma'am uh thank you shubhayu so uh, i personally feel that uh, we uh, like you know shashi sir and uh, ma'am has also shared that we are very good at um, uh, our our culture is very rich so if we talk about our culture and tradition um, along with that i would want that we talk about our value system also so our value system is something which is very very strong and even today even uh, you know i we are, we are very proud of our value system the kind of uh, um, uh, what should i say the kind of upbringing that we provide to our kids in our uh, indian families that is absolutely exceptional that is first thing so uh, from the educational point of view the value system I, that is the first thing the second thing that i feel is that um, when we are talking about uh, you know creativity i think indian brains brains are the most creative brains and we can definitely and we are in fact making a mark with our creativity so that is the second thing and the third thing that we've been talking about throughout the session the heterogeneity the the diversity in our uh, culture the diversity in our society so that is also a positive point in a sense that we have varied experiences with us so varied experiences from different cultures varied experiences from different backgrounds and everything is um you know very very attractive for the foreign lands to see because what we can provide to people uh, outside globally maybe um, no other country is able to provide that kind of heterogeneity and experience so i think these three things uh, from the perspective of education i personally feel that these are the three things that we can take out uh, globally and um, people will love that good good wonderful thank you thank you so much for sparing time and thank you so much for your valuable inputs i'm sure everybody who had joined the session today definitely got the time's worth uh, it is now my job to quickly do the thank yous uh, first of all varit sir thank you so much for that wonderful introduction i think when you said that you hope that india would become a global destination for students across all levels of education you really spoke for all of us because that is what we would want to see in india we've done that in healthcare we've done that in uh, a lot of ites 
we've done that in certain spheres but in the in the level of education we at one point in time held perhaps the number one position in the world and i'm sure if the new education policy is adopted not only in letter but in spirit we would travel in that correct direction uh, thank you so much for that mr shastri sir thank you so much for sparing your time to thank be you here with us uh, so your years of experience and particularly the stress that you laid on uh, the 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 vedas having survived so many years right i think that speaks volumes about the wealth that we have inherently as a country and it is a matter of just unlocking the potential through the various mechanisms of our education system thank you so much sir uh, kushum ma'am thank you so much for being here uh, you tackled two or three quite uh, uncomfortable topics but i must say you did that beautifully and i think that's the whole motive of this platform to have an open free dialogue an open discourse about various issues that plague our education system talk about what's great about our education system and arrive at common solutions thank you so much for adding to its glory ma'am uh, vivid sir thank you so much i am a huge fan of diversity myself and for you to also say that it is one of the things that we could export just made my day we are where a 5000 year old veda meets the cheapest 5g networks and that's the spectrum that we present ladies and gentlemen thank you so much for sticking around i think we've had a fantastic discussion and i thank you so much for being a part of it thank you thank you thank you shubhangi thank, thank you so much you were a fantastic host in the yeah, kind yeah. of uh, you know you you kept us mind throughout the session and i must congratulate you for doing that thank, thank you so you. much thank you shubhangi thank, thank you thank you very much uh, well to all the members of the audience we will see you again soon with our next webinar until then please take care stay safe and goodbye goodbye thank you